<clears throat> Hello again. Before we start the lesson for now, I want to mention to you that the last time I appeared on this program, Brother Young told you that I had preached my first sermon in the summer of 1938. He said, now, I don't know how old he is, and if I knew, I wouldn't tell you. I don't mind telling you that I'm 84. I try to be a young 84. I enjoy preaching. I preach every Sunday morning except the third Sunday at the Grassy Lead Congregation of the Church of Christ, about five and a half miles south of Corning. And I have a one-minute radio spot Monday through Friday on our local station in Pocahontas. I hold meetings occasionally, preach funerals occasionally, because it's something that I enjoy. It's something that I feel that the Lord expects me to do. And I have said that I hope to preach until I'm 90. I don't know whether I'll make it or not, but I'm working on it. Just thought I would mention that if some of you had wondered, because he didn't know, and he said if he had known, he wouldn't say. I just don't mind telling you. Now, we've been talking about the Lord's people. Who are the Lord's people? We need to consider that the Lord's people have various characteristics whereby they can be recognized. Automobiles look very much alike, but they have distinguishing characteristics. And sometime when you're go going into a parking lot at the mall or wherever, you might see 50 cars. All of them look very similar to each other, but most all of them have some differing characteristics and a greater degree of puzzlement and distinguishing one from the other would be, as you sometimes have seen, a picture, say, of 150 penguins on an ice floe. I wonder how Mr. Penguin knows that that Mrs. Penguin is his wife, because to me they all look alike. Now, people also look alike. We have differences and we are recognizable. And Christians have differences also that are recognizable. Now we've studied about the fact that the Lord's people are those who have been converted to the Lord. The Lord's people are those people who are penitent of sins. And we want to consider today that the Lord's people are people who are separate. They have separated themselves from the people of the world. Now we read a week ago from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, in which we read that the Lord said, Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And in this chapter, in 2 Corinthians 6, he made the promise that he would be their people, their, their God rather, and they would be his people. And I want us to notice particularly verses 17 and 18 of 2 Corinthians chapter 6. He said, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. In the verses preceding this, the Lord had asked, What concord or what agreement can there be between the believers and unbelievers? What concord or agreement can there be between Christ and Belial? Or what concord or agreement can there be between light and darkness? And in the presenting of these things, they're very different, easily recognizable as being different. So God gave the commandment to his people. You come out from the people of the world. You live a righteous life. You serve me regularly so that people can look at you and know that you belong to me. Uh, Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And this is what the Apostle Paul had in mind in his writing this to the Christians at Corinth, that they were to be a different people. In uh, Titus, the second chapter, verses 11 through 14, I want to read that there are people who are a special possession of God. And in this, beginning in verse 11, the Apostle Paul has written that the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared unto all men, and it teaches us 
how that we are to live. It says that we are to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Let's notice this word peculiar just a little bit. It does not mean that we're to be peculiar in the way that we dressed or in the way that some of us style our hair. We're not to be peculiar in that. But we are to be peculiar in the fact that we belong to the Lord. We're not like all the people of the world, but rather we live differently from the way they live. The New King James Version of the Bible, where this word peculiar is listed here in Titus 2 verse 14, states that we are to be His own special people. And that's what God wants. He wants us to be His own special people. We come out from the world and we belong to God. Now, I mentioned that we're not to be peculiar in the way that we dress, except I think there is a word that we need to consider, or a thought that we need to consider for a moment, <clears throat> and that is that our dress needs to be modest, needs to be in order, not outlandish, and uh, definitely to be moral. And some people consider that to be peculiar. But in 1 Timothy, the second chapter, Paul wrote to Timothy, verse 8, he said, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Now here Paul is writing about men, that they are to be holy, they are not to be doubting, they are not to have wrath, but they are to lift up holy hands or righteous hands. And then he said in verse 9, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women in profession godliness with good works. So what Paul has said here, that a woman's adornment should be not the jewelry she wears, not the makeup that she wears, not the way she styles her hair, but good works. And that then is to be that which adorns her or which is beautiful about her. Not the physical appearance, but the good works that she does. And as we get closer to warm weather, people need to remember that God expects His people to dress modestly as people of God. God's people are to be different from the world. In Romans the 12th chapter, verses 1 and 2, Paul said that these people, this is particularly the second verse of Romans 12, he said to the Christians at Rome, do not be conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, conforming to the world is dressing like the world does. Conforming to the world is living like the world does. But Paul said you are to come out, you are to be transformed, changed from being like the people of the world in their wickedness, in their sinfulness, in the fact that they know no shame, but rather that you're to live modestly, dress modestly, and act modestly. God's people do not love the things of the world. In 1 John, the second chapter, verses 15 through 17, John wrote, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, but all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away with the lust thereof. So here John says that these things that are worldly, that pertain to the flesh, pertain to the baser thought of man, those Christians are not to love. And God's people will not love those things. God's people have been redeemed uh, through the blood of Christ. In 1 Peter, the second chapter, uh, Peter writes concerning our redemption, and also in the first chapter, we're going to look at both of these chapters. But in the first 
chapter of 1 Peter, he said, beginning in verse 17, he said, If you call on the Father, who without respect of person judgeth according to every man's work, pass your sojourning here in fear. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Peter has said to these people, you are redeemed. You've been redeemed by the Lord, not by the things of the world, not by gold, not by silver, but by the precious blood of Christ, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, and the unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. Friends, we're talking here about God's people. And Peter, in writing to these people, said they had been redeemed. They had purified their souls through obeying the truth. In their doing that, they had been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God that lives and abides forever. So it is through the word of God that our purification comes. And uh, through that word, we are to, we have received remission of sins, and we are to live as people who do belong to the Lord. So, uh, as Peter wrote these people, they were redeemed, they had been brought out of the world, thus they had been separated from the world. Let's remember that we read earlier where Paul wrote the people at Corinth, Come out from among them, be ye separate, touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So these people then are a separate people. In 1 Peter, the second chapter, we're going to read verses 9 and 10, wherein Peter describes these people who belong to the Lord as a precious, peculiar people, a chosen people, a royal generation. Let's notice what he said. Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. Now we run into that word peculiar again, and many of the translations read that, a purchased people. How were they purchased? They were purchased with the blood of Christ, as he had told them in that which we read a moment ago from the first chapter. They had been redeemed by the blood of Christ when they had born, been born again into the kingdom of our Lord. And he said that they, have, they are a purchased people, that they might show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And notice this statement, particularly in verse 10, which in time past were not a people, but now are the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. What is it then that Peter is writing to these people? There was a time when you were not God's people, but now you are God's people. You have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. You have brought yourself into the family of God by being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God that lives and abides forever. So he said to them, they had not obtained mercy before, but they now have obtained mercy by the fact that they have become God's people. Now, we've been talking about God's people who live in this age, but God has always had a special people. In Deuteronomy, the seventh chapter, I'm going to read verses six through eight, in which the Lord has told the people of Israel that they are his special people. He said, Thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto him, to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Now, these are God's chosen people. 
the children of Israel, who were God's chosen people in the years of old. The Lord did not set His love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because He would keep the oath which He had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore, notice verse 9, Know therefore that the Lord thy God he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love Him, and keep His commandments in a thousand or to a thousand generations. So God has said here to the people of old, You are my special people. Why? Because they were a separate nation. They did not live as the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, and the other people that lived throughout the land of Canaan in that day. But they were a people that God said that were to keep themselves separate. They were not to intermarry with the people. They were not to worship as did those people, but that they were to follow the Lord in all of the things that they did. Now, I want us to notice that there are great blessings that come from our being separate from the world. God's people are a separate people. And I'm going to reread verses 17 and 18 of 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's note what it says. Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Let's ask ourselves, what blessings come from God's people being a separate people. Here, some of those blessings at least have been stated. God said, I will receive you. You shall be my sons and daughters. I will be a father unto you. And this is the promise that the Lord has made to His people. Why? Because they came out from the world. And we have noted several different passages in our study today that tell us that we're to not live as the world lives. We're to not love the things the world loves, but rather that we are to concentrate on those things that God would have us to do. And let us ask a question, my friends, of you today. How can you become separated from the world and become sons and daughters of God? The Scriptures answer that very easily for us. In Galatians, the third chapter, verses 26 and 27, the Apostle Paul wrote to these Christians of Galatia and said, You are all sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ did put on Christ. Now, these people were sons of God, and the Scriptures usually uh, refer to the male, but it means all people, male and female, men and women, these people were children of God, and they became such when they were baptized into Christ. They thus put on Christ and became members of the Lord's kingdom. They were separate from the world by the fact that they had been baptized and washed away their sins. God's people remain separate. That's the way we want you to be. Thank you.